Hello world and welcome to another episode of Wombo Storm! It's a show about Commander, the greatest format of Magic the Gathering, in my opinion. This week, we're going to be taking a look at Nekusar, the Mind Razor. Originally, uh, I built this deck for a series called EDH Rec Tech. Yeah, as I've been engaged with this, uh, I have realized that Wombo Storm is my true calling. This is the content that uh, I want to be creating on the internet uh, as it relates to Magic. The Gathering, and uh, it, it, it should help mitigate some of the confusion about my relationship with EDH Rec, or I should say my lack of a relationship with EDH Rec. I was just very excited to make content, and I think I stepped on a little bit of maybe their branding intellectual property toes. I mean, it's, it's cool. It's cool. We've been emailing. We're cool. We're going to email Donald with a link to this episode, too. Be like, hey, doing Wombo Storm now. Sorry, didn't mean to impose. Anyway, uh... This is originally a budget deck for EDH rec tech, <laughs> but is now going to be the focus of Wombo Storm. Nekusar the Mind Razor, according to EDH rec, uh, the all-time most popular commanders list. Nekusar clocks in at about number five, exactly number five, in fact. Uh, and, I mean, every metagame is different. I am sure that there are many Nekusar pilots out there uh, who run a kind of all-in glass cannon Nekusar wheel, wheel, wheel until our opponents are dead strategy to great effect. But in my experience, if you look at just the top line of popular commanders here, Nekusar comes close to being the, the biggest underperformer of the bunch. In my experience, playing in kind of combo control heavy meta games, Nekusar just doesn't stack up that well. The natural Nekusar strategy people are drawn to has some serious flaws, and I want to talk about those right here because I think it might be instructive. Excuse me. If you're unfamiliar, though, first of all, Nekusar, uh, five mana in some pretty good colors. Grixis there for a zombie wizard, 2-4 body that uh, functions as a howling mine. Everyone draws an extra card during their draw step. Uh, but also, group slug, not hug, it deals damage to opponents every time those opponents draw a card. So with Nekusar on the board, you know, you're clocking in at two damage per turn automatically, and there are ways to ramp that up. You know, you can play redundant effects like Fate Unraveler. Um, sometimes I give advice... It's like, don't play too many redundant effects in a deck. But if you're doing, I mean, because if it's already in your command zone, you don't need to dedicate valuable, precious deck slots to also doing the same thing. But if it's something like dealing one damage, you know, those, those abilities do stack. And so if you're trying to do the glass cannon all-in thing with Nekusar, Fade Unraveler is very common, very good include, although I think the whole strategy is a little bit weak. That's what I'm trying to talk about. Uh, and wheel effects, obviously, are very, very good with Nekusar. The whole idea of most Nekusar decks is to stack one or two or three wheel effects where opponents discard their hands and draw fresh hands on top of a couple duplicate ways to deal damage for every card that they draw. But in order to get to like a critical mass where people are taking 30 or more damage, potentially lethal damage for all opponents, uh, you need like, what, 7, 14, 24 times, you know, that's four wheels of fortune with one Nekusar. You'd need like at least three wheels of fortune plus Nekusar plus Fate Unraveler, so, some combination of like four. Five uh, wheel effects and or things that deal damage every time opponents draw cards effect to get there. And that's hard to do. It takes time to do. Maybe you spread that out over multiple turns. All the while, you're feeding opponents exactly the cards they need to deal with you as a threat. I can't tell you how often I've seen this sort of a line. If uh, you know, the Nekusar player has Nekusar and Fate Unraveler in play, they cast a Wheel of Fortune, and in response, you know, opponents have pretty consistently full hands because they've been drawing extra cards every turn. Uh, you know, if an opponent is sitting back on some sort of creature removal, they have no incentive with a Wheel of Fortune on the stack to hold back any removal, they might as well remove Nekusar and remove the Fate Unraveler. This doesn't have to be just one opponent doing it. Often, you know, three opponents. Your, all three of your opponents can work together to make sure that nobody takes damage from wheeling and wheeling and wheeling. Uh, and so, you know, what you've basically done is refilled your opponent's hands with no drawback for them. Uh, that doesn't happen every time, but even when, you know, the Nekuzar player successfully gets one wheel off, often they have to plow through a counter spell or something. It's just, it's a lot of tempo, a lot of mana to dedicate to trying to brute force through three opponents all by yourself, right? 
Uh, it, it, it's, it's hard to, you know, Nekusar brings a sledgehammer where a scalpel might be better. If you're doing the all in glass cannon, trying to, you know, wheel, wheel, wheel the deal, like 50 million damage to my opponents all at once. You, you can't put pressure on one opponent rather than another, right? You can't effectively manage the crackback. You know, if you have a deck that's just trying to win with big fat flyers, for example, you can swing into an opponent that's maybe fallen behind the rest of the table. And even if they're mad at you, don't have that much agency to do anything with it. Or, you know, if you're in pole position or close to it, if it's kind of hard to say, you know, putting pressure on one or two opponents with combat damage is not the same thing as threatening all opponents all at the same time, right? Uh, there's that whole boil the frog uh, metaphor. Like if you put a frog in water that's already boiling, it's going to jump out. Where if you put it in room temperature water and then gradually turn up the heat, the frog uh, will stay in there until it dies. It's not true, actually. Frogs are smarter than you might give them credit for. And once the water gets hot enough, they will jump out regardless of how hot it was when it started or how quickly the uh, water has been getting hotter. But I digress for the purposes of this video. Let's assume that frogs are as dumb as we all thought they were at one point. <laughs> okay, right. So this brings us to this week's deck. I, I'm calling it <laughs> Razor's Edge, like the mind razor. Like it's a double entendre. Yeah, it's pretty, yeah. It's a budget build, like I said. Uh, some of the cards in this have been creeping up in price pretty consistently. So it's not the most budget budget. The restriction I gave myself for all EDH Rec Tech videos was no card could be more than $15. I figure that's close-ish to the budget that a lot of people are working with. When you factor in that, you know, many of those cards will be like 25 cents, 50 cents anyway. But uh, yeah, like Cyclonic Rift is getting really close to that. Ristic Study is getting really close to that. A lot of cards that could go for a reprint in Commander 2019, maybe, Wizards, maybe even sooner than that. That's, kind of, that's still a ways off. But the idea here is we're trying to play a more subtle sort of game with Nakusar rather than trying to win through the, you know, let's call it what it is. It's a pseudo combo of wheel, 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 ping, ping, ping. Uh, we're viewing Nakusar's one damage at a time pings as just a little bit of edge. Right, that's the razor's edge, a little bit of upside within a more traditional control, really hard control strategy, not so much of a glass cannon. So in, in general, when giving people advice about just good stuff deck strategies, um, I, I tell them to run about 15 ramp effects, 15 draw effects, and 15 control effects. That's like most of your non-land deck slots, I understand, but they're, they're like the fruits and vegetables, you know. Y y you have to dedicate a lot of deck slots to uh, the fundamentals of deck building, right? If a deck is able to accelerate its game plan, keep its game plan going, even into the late game through card draw, and interrupt our opponent's game plans. I mean, not, not every deck wants to do all of these things to the same degree, but in general, if your deck is doing all of those things, it is probably very, very close to being a good commander deck right but what is in your command zone can affect how much of each of these exactly you want you're going to adjust the soup a little bit uh, based on what we're working with and what we're working with in the command zone is not a win con i mean it, it can be a win condition obviously in some decks but in this deck nekusar is not the win condition we're not trying to just churn 40 damage through nekusar and redundant effects we're seeing it as more of just like a howling mine in the command zone we know that if we ramp into a turn three or four nekusar that every game is going to have this sort of group slug dynamic all opponents are going to have a lot of resources they're going to be building boards very quickly so we can, uh, you know, build our deck accordingly. We can prepare by cutting back on the card draw. We know that our hand is going to be pretty consistently full regardless. We still run some card draw effects, but not nearly as many as most of the good stuff style decks I run. And instead, we run more ramp. And maybe more importantly, we run a whole bunch of control because control effects are disproportionately good when we know that opponents are going to constantly have a full hand because we're feeding them extra cards. Uh, so we run 25 <laughs> control effects. It's mostly a good stuff package with a heavy emphasis on mass bounce and mass removal. You see Cyclonic Rift there, uh, Toxic Deluge, another card that's going up in price pretty quickly. Star Storm, that one's not too expensive at this point. Uh, and then also just like premium spot removal. Commit to Memory is an excellent card. I mean, four mana is a, a little bit more tempo than most targeted removal effects uh, take up, but it deals with 
any threat, basically. Any non-land permanent or spell that's on the stack. It's just a super duper versatile card. And putting it second from the top in the library is an enormous tempo swing in a multiplayer format in particular. There's a lot of people's turns that you have to get through before you get to draw that card uh, one more time. And disallow, terminate, yeah, again, just generic good stuff control, counter spell type control, and, uh, you know, creature removal. Um, and control, having this many control effects guarantees that the game is going to go pretty long. It doesn't guarantee it, but most games are going to go longer than uh, the average commander game because we run 25 control effects. We can reset the board, reset the board, deal with a potential game ending threat over and over again. And so rather than going for massive damage during one critical turn with Nekusar and redundant effects, we're boiling that frog, right? We're trying to just have inevitability with Nekusar and a couple other things that I'll get to in a minute and just make sure the game lasts long enough that taking two damage every turn starts to really add up and gives our uh, combat-based strategy an advantage. But it, it's a combat-based strategy because it's a budget deck, but if you uh, wanted to upgrade this deck a little bit, it would not be hard to swap out some of our big fat flyers that I'll get to at the end uh, with, you know, a, a control and tutor package, for example. We're in good colors for that. But yeah, Nekusar helps with inevitability if we're trying to punch through with combat damage for the win. Um, ramp is also just very good. I mean, it's good in every deck, but it's particularly good in a hug game state because the player with the most resources, the player best able to take advantage of the extra cards that everyone is getting is going to benefit the most from them, right? And if it's, you know, an early game situation where your group hug situation is uh, creating maybe eight, nine cards in hand by end of turn, you know, I mean, that would be if we didn't run enough mana rocks. Often, cards that we'd be discarding uh, are instead mana rocks when we run more uh, than an average amount. Uh, and so we can just play a two mana, three mana mana rock instead of having to like discard at end of turn, turn four, five, or six uh, before we've played a whole lot of spells throughout the game. Um, and so to make room for all of these ramp effects and control effects, I have cut back on the draw suite. Um, th th these are all of the cards that are dedicated to card draw in the deck. Three of them uh, lean into the group slug idea a little bit. Temple Bell, Well of Ideas, Dictative Crucifix. Uh, you know, but none of those group slug, group hug ideas uh, leave opponents with the impression that they could very quickly be one shot. Right? I, I would rather run Temple Bell, Well of Ideas, Dictative Crucifix in this build than you know that fade unraveler because as soon as drawing one card deals two damage instead of one damage then your opponents might start sweating a little bit they might you know understand that nekusar has a reputation and then the polarity of the entire pod becomes unfavorable to the Nekusar player. You have three people basically agreeing that they need to deal with you before you deal with all of them all at once. So, uh, yeah, Temple Bell, Dictate, Well of Ideas also disproportionately benefit the person who casts them, right? If I flash in a Dictate of Crucifix, I am the first person to benefit from it. If I cast a Temple Bell, I can wait until the end step before our turn to tap it so that our opponents don't have access to that one extra card during their main phases at the very least. And well of ideas, you know, it just draws us twice as many cards and draws us cards as soon as we cast it. And then we have three just good stuff. Draw effect, stroke of genius, recurring insight, ristic study, ways to uh, fill our hands with lots of cards for sometimes bargain prices. Ristic study, three mana, although getting close to 15 bucks, which is crazy for a common. Um, I also have three just miscellaneous value cards in here. Uh, Worst Fears and Mind Slaver are particularly good in a an accelerated game state, right? If we know that there's going to be a pseudo howling mind in play every game, then I opponents are going to draw lots of cards, build big scary boards, have lots of resources to work with. Wouldn't it be a shame if it was actually us getting to work with those resources? Yeah, often in a group hug environment, Worst Fears, Mind Slaver can be... Uh, not the play that ends the game itself, but the setup play for a situation where you ultimately uh, reign victorious. And uh, Mystical Tutor is just a generic good stuff value card that doesn't fit into any other category cleanly. It's a value. It's a value card. You know. Uh, also, here's how we win. Emrakul, another way to uh, take control of hugged out opponents boards and generic good stuff big flying creatures nothing has uh, less than five power and things that only have five power also have pretty juicy etbs like the sphinx of a thune rune scar demon hellkite igniter can close out games very quickly considering that we run 18 mana rocks yes 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 this is the deck 
Oh yeah, thirty-eight lands also. You know, the typical land suite. Uh, it's a it's simple deck, very simple. It's just ramp card draw, control value, air force lands, boom. Uh, but it works, right? You could easily upgrade it, like I said earlier, to a more competitive uh, deck if you just replace the air force with a tutor and combo package of some sort. Uh, yeah, Nekusar often you know, suckers people into building this all-in glass cannon strategy that would I mean it, it would be very powerful in one-on-one, -on -one, right? I'm sure in one-on-one -on -one it's a, a very strong strategy, but as soon as you have multiple opponents, it just creates, it incentivizes this shift in polarity where you find yourself playing arch enemy, and that's just a tough situation to claw your way out of game after game after game. Uh, people overlook the fact that Nekyasar, the Mind Razor, is also just a pretty decent con Control commander, if you view his card draw and damage, is you know, basically upside, not an all in sort of game plan. So that's the deck I'm supposed to grow. And now I'm going to goldfish that deck. Let's go. Let's, let's take a look at this. All right, let's take a peek at how Nekusar looks when playing against the goldfish anyway. Shuffle, 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 draw our opening hand at a glance. I mean, we've run 18 mana rocks in the deck and we didn't draw any of them. Let's assume we get a free mulligan. Uh. There we do have a mana rock. We have is it sig is it signet? Is it though? Is it really? And we have four lands, which is pretty good. And then some payoff spells. Once we get into the mid game, we can ramp into a turn four Nekusar, uh, and then have a reliquary tower, so we don't have to discard at end of turn. My dog is eating her food uh, directly behind me. My mic is facing it. I'm not quite sure how far the mic uh, can like hear things. But if you hear what sounds like a dog eating food, it's because my dog is eating food. And even if you don't hear it, you should just know that I can hear it. And I'm distracted by it. But that's okay. Uh, turn one. We're going to draw an exotic orchard. Okay, we have plenty of lands. I uh, don't think we'll have a problem hitting uh, land drops for most of our turns. Like I go to turn two. We will untap, upkeep, draw another card. And I should say uh, at the very beginning of gold fishing right here, playing Manor Rock, that... Uh, and step because this deck is such a heavy control focused deck gold fishing is going to be a little bit weird i'm just going to get to a point where i have some control effects and i have some semblance of a board presence you know so much of what dictates what control effects do over the course of the game is what your opponents are doing obviously like more so than for most decks that you know it, it, you know it's just to give you an idea it's not going to be quite as uh thrilling as maybe pursuing one specific combo and you know, firing it off on turn four blah blah, blah. all right Untap. Call this what? This is going to be turn three. We're going to draw a counterspell. There it is. And uh, yeah, get that city of brass out there, whatever. We have four mana available, uh, which is not really enough to do anything other than sit back on a disallow, on a counterspell. Let's go ahead and say we uh, fire off a disallow during someone else's turn. And go to turn four. Just slowing down the game, ensuring that it lasts for at least a little while. We will play a mountain for turn. We have five mana available, which would be enough to drop a potential board wipe or drop our commander or do nothing and sit back on a counter spell. I think that the game plan is usually gonna be to get uh, Nekisar out there pretty quickly. We'll go to turn five. We will untap, we will draw, we will draw. We will go to our main phase. We will play a reliquary tower. Not super relevant just yet, but maybe it could get there. We have six mana available, is that right? Yes, six mana available. Um, Krosis' is Charm Cross is three, you could sit back on that, or we could start being aggressive, drop a Locust God, something like that. Again, this all depends. These choices are all gonna be contingent on what our opponents look like they're doing, fixing to do. Um, in the sort of meta game that I have this deck pegged at power level wise, I would assume that you know on turn five, People might be beginning to build like scary boards, but I don't know that. Um, I, I don't know that uh, too many threats are gonna not have summoning sickness at this point in the game. So I think for six mana we can get away with playing a locust god. Whenever we draw a card, make some insects, make an insect, and uh, yeah, it's pretty resilient too. So even if we do kill it in one of our own board wipes, it will just come right back. We'll have to cast it one more time, but you know that's fine. Go to turn six, untap. We will draw. We will draw. Oh, we have a land. <laughs> With the opening hand that we had, I was, I'm was i surprised that uh, 
We just barely hit our land drop for turn, but that's all right. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven available. Casting Mind Slaver without the mana to also pop it off same turn is a bold play. It immediately puts a target on your head, and it's probably a little half-baked at this point. We want to let our opponents continue to exist in a group hug environment for a little uh, more time before we try to take control of their turns. And also, you know, we might as well wait until we've had to wipe the board twice before we even consider Mind Slaver because I think of this as like a, a, a potential game ending play. Also, I forgot that uh, we're going to have a couple of insects. I'm going to go ahead and use counters to denote how many of these we have rather than making copies of it because it might overwhelm the freeware program known as Cockatrice that I use for these. Um, okay. All right. All right. What are we doing? Turn six, two, three, four, five, six, seven mana available. Yeah, I love Decree of Pain, one of my favorite cards in all of Magic. I, I mean, with this board presence, I think in this deck, we just sit back on our control effects. We pass turn, and we wait for opponents to try to do scary things. I don't know, let's say we cast Crows as a charm. Let's just say that we did that. And uh, let's go to turn seven, untap. We will draw, draw. We will get two more insect tokens. Let's see, set counters red up to four. There we go. Uh, main phase. So we drew a land, so we'll go ahead and play that. It gives our opponent spirits, but we don't care a whole lot. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight mana would be enough to cast Decree of Pain, which would be great considering how many insects uh, we have. We would draw a whole buttload of cards, give us a whole lot of agency. But, I mean, given that we have such excellent flying blockers, we're probably not sweating too much from anything that our opponents are doing. We might want to let them keep whatever board they have developed to this point because we assume they won't swing at us because they know we have blockers and any laser cannon that's not pointed at you but also is not yours might as well be yours because it's pointed at your opponents. Right, so I, I think that we can sit back. I think we're an excellent, excellent position right now. Uh, probably two mana, drop a Mind Stone. But from there, I would just pass turn, you know, probably counter something. We even have the agency. Let's see, how much mana do we have? Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six mana. Yeah, we have exactly enough to cast Commit to Memory, and, or yeah, Commit, I guess, and a counter spell if we get in a, kind of a blue mage sort of a duel. And, you know, our broader strategy right now is just sit back, control the game, reset the board, rebuild the board, let our opponents attack each other because we have Locust God and Blockers coming out of that. And eventually, you know, Nekusar damage is going to get up to a point where it's pretty relevant, but opponents shouldn't be worried about us one shot them with like a couple of wheels on the same turn because that's not the sort of deck that we're playing uh yeah you, you get an idea let's see next turn we would draw island and command tower so we're definitely good on land drops if we needed to we could decree of pain and that would draw us at least what that would be six seven eight cards just from our board alone one two three four five six seven eight and you can begin to see that we you know it, it's going to continue to uh you know our board is going to gradually get more and more and more agency meanwhile we have enough control effects i guess we didn't draw into that many control effects right there we're sitting on a star storm and uh kagamaro but niv mizzet is going to draw us a bunch of cards do a lot of damage to living primordial is pseudo control when it comes into play we can do other things uh yeah you, you you get the idea. You see what it might be like to play Nekusar as an all-in control deck rather than an all-in gla glass cannon pseudo combo through wheel sort of deck. Anyway, remember, the real metagame is the metagame, and the real win condition is making sure everyone's having lots of fun. That's, I think, the update to the uh, catchphrase there. Uh, call your mother if you haven't in a while. Anyway, you might be able to get away with a, a, a week uh, here and there. Not calling, but she wants to know how you're doing. Uh, and until next time, I'm Dan Brown. Peace, love, and pizza.